What's up? This is Rebel Radio. What up? What up? This is DJ Newmark. This is Peanut Butter Wolf. It's your boy. It's okay. Keep checking out Rebel Radio. Rebel Radio. This is Rebel Radio. We're in the place right here. Uh-huh. Rebel Radio is going down. Would you say Rebel Radio? Oh, wait. Let's do it again. Rebel Radio. What's up, y'all? Welcome back to Rebel Radio, the weekly show where I talk to the rebels who are shaping youth culture. We find out how they do it, why they do it, and what you can do to get a little piece of the pie for yourself. I'm your host, Josh Levine, and my guest this week is Michael Tolberg. I've known Michael for um, many, many years. He's been a photographer in the, in the dance music scene. When I was at Herb, he was shooting for us, um, as well as many of the, the, the other magazines of the time. And he's got a new book out called The Raver Stories Project, where he's really trying to capture the energy of the rave scene of, of dance music from the early days to up to now. Uh, some great stories in his book and great stories he's going to share with us on this show today. We'll get into that right after our EDM.com track of the week. Radio is the only show to bring you new music every week from our friends over at EDM.com. This week's track was Midnight Quickie and Blue Claire with Get Away. Hope you enjoyed that. If you do, get over to EDM.com, check out more new music. And right now, let's get into the interview with Michael Tolbert. So, dude, Michael, thanks for being here, man. I appreciate it. Uh, my pleasure. You coming by. Um, it's, always, it's always great to see, you know... I stopped working with Herb ten years ago, mm-hmm. and uh, you know, time just flies by. And then, yeah, you know, like that was such a huge part of my life, and it was a great <laughs> time. I'm sure you remember when, you know, we had all these great writers and photographers. Oh, and very well. People come and people would just come through the office, and you're always meeting people. Mm-hmm. And, uh, so I kind of miss that. I, I miss that too. I mean, Herb, it was a great, uh, a great atmosphere there because yeah. you had. So much, like you said, so many great uh, writers and also uh, photographers, you know, like myself and totally. some others, um, who were all basically there for the same reason. Yeah. You know, it um, it wasn't even so much just a thing of uh, working for Herb. Mm-hmm. It was a thing of, of, of supporting the whole electronic music scene and, you know, struggling against the, you know, the mainstream media and their almost universal negative slant you know yeah. towards the music towards the artists towards the people in the scene you yeah. know and it was to be fair that was also true with the other magazines you know that sure. were out there i mean because we all worked almost all of us worked for all of them yeah you know i mean with i'm talking about bpm and insider and yeah uh, and uh mixer you know mm-hmm. and lotus you know mm-hmm. and other ones like that but yeah, yeah it, was, it was a great example of a, a huge community you know just pulling together and uh and basically well, basically, it was just a huge uh, DIY, you know, mentality, which was sure. pretty much born out of necessity. Because yeah. again, the mainstream just would not, in those days, just would not accept the music or the scene or the people in it. So crazy to think. I mean, that wasn't that long ago. It wasn't. Um, so I want to get into all that, but but let's yes. start with you. Yeah. Um, and how you got to all this. So, do you remember? Do you remember the first record you bought? The first record I bought? You mean electronic music? No, just as a kid. As a kid, the very first record I bought. Oh, boy. That's a good question. Uh, This is back in the 70s. Okay. It was probably a Kiss record. Okay. Because, you know, I was a young, you know, young boy. And Kiss, of course, was, you know, the uh, band of superheroes just about. So it was a natural appeal, you know, to, uh, to the young kids and stuff. That's, of course, is something that would drive... Ace Freely and Peter Chris nuts. Oh, I'm you know, sure. Because yeah, they, they wanted, wanted to be, be rock and rollers and stuff. Yeah. And Paul and Gene are telling them, no, 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 we have to play for the kids now, right. you know, and because we have to keep the merchandising going. Totally. So, so. Yeah, so it was probably a Kiss record. Was, well, Gene, he, he he knew what he was doing. Oh, yeah. Yeah, they did. I'm sure. Um, <laughs> so, and then what about electronic music? What was your, 
Do you remember like well, discovering I mean, that? I well, I discovered electronic music again in the late seventies, early eighties through rock. Okay, because that was that was my thing. That yeah. was what I grew. I grew up in Boston or the suburbs of Boston, rather. Okay, uh, raised on what's now called classic rock. Sure, you know, and um, so with exposure to a lot of groups, you know, like Pink Floyd, mm -hmm. or if you want to get a bit more new agey, uh, you know like uh, Tangerine Dream, mm -hmm. you know, and stuff, or Vangelis, you know. Even. Oh, wow. Um, you know, that that stuff would be, that early electronic stuff would be filtering in to the mainstream and stuff. I mean, in the case of Vangelis, you know, that was, of course, Chariots of Fire, you right. know, that movie. Yeah, yeah. Um, and Pink Floyd is just, you know, being Pink Floyd. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know? So, uh, yeah, it was a... It was a slow kind of uh, immersion in electronic music, and it, that became easier in the '80s as more you know synths and stuff right. became more prevalent you know around when you started getting out of the post classic rock you know '70s period and into the post punk new agey you know, I mean a uh, new wave uh -huh. '80s you know with more synths and more and the first primitive computers the first Macs you know. Uh, you know, with meaty, you know, mm -hmm. and all that. Mm -hmm. but, uh, but that was just the beginning, of course. You know? right. And it was an exciting time and a bit of a confusing time, too. But there was no culture at the time. Like, there, you know, it was rock music, yeah, right? right? And then, you know, the, the electronic music or dance music culture didn't sort of emerge until no, the late later 80s. on. Yeah. So what yeah. was your first exposure to that? My first exposure to that outside of movies and TV and all that um, was a place in Boston, which is long gone. Uh, it's a, It was a club called Venus de Milo. Mm. And Venus in those days, in the late 80s, early 90s, uh, that's on used to be on Lansdowne Street behind Fenway Park. That's where the main drag is in Boston. Mm. It's where Avalon, you know, mm -hmm. has been Axis and lots of other clubs, it, yeah. both electronic and not, you know, have been on that stretch in, on Lansdowne Street. And uh, Venus was different, uh, very different from the normal clubs at the time. It was really going almost all electronic. Really? Um, yeah. And the dance floor was top notch, yeah. you know, top notch for the time. And I remember one of the early times I went in there and I went up to the DJ. And of course, I knew nothing about DJ etiquette, you know, back uh -huh. then because I was just a stupid kid. Of at course. The time. Uh, I asked him, you know, if you could play any Prince. And he said, no. And I was like, okay, these guys are not going to play Prince. Uh -huh. This is interesting. Yeah. <laughs> you know, what, what else? And what I was hearing, of course, was early house music, although right. I didn't know it was called house music. Nobody in Boston knew it was called house music sure. at that time. It was under the larger umbrella term of techno, right. you know, because yeah. for lack of a better phrase at that time, because, you know, we were, we were uneducated at that point. Of course. Yeah. Yeah. So, so what did that, what did that do to you? Like, what, what was it? That attracted you to that scene. I, it was different. It yeah. was, um, and f largely for one of the reasons why I dove into the rave scene in the '90s. You know, later, uh, because I get bored very easily. Yeah. <laughs> I get very easily, and let's face it, the mainstream music machine, which is largely pop driven and yeah. stuff. I mean, it for me, it gets real old real fast sure you know and well it's based on repetition among other things yes yeah. and um so it's um and I, I just was looking for stuff that was different i was also looking for different rock clubs you know mm -hmm. at the time and stuff which i was frequenting at the time this is yeah. still in boston yeah, yeah. um i mean i remember the paradise which is still there right. i think in uh, boston i mean that was where i first saw a uh, blues traveler oh know, wow there and uh, when they put out their first album I'd heard nothing about them, and uh, you know, and I managed to get there early, and I was perched right on the monitor, you know, like that. Which for a yeah, nineteen-year-old kid, you know, that's pretty cool. Yeah, it's exciting. Yeah, and uh, I mean, sure. just being, you know, just sitting there in the chair and zoning out to "Shine on You, Crazy Diamond," you uh -huh. know, something like that. Yeah, so. yeah. <laughs> so was it? Were you thinking? Obviously, I mean, it sounds like you were really into music. Mm -hmm. um, was that going to be a career path? I was hoping it would. I mean, I would. Was I, I was a high schooler. I mean, I was a frustrated would be, you know, lead singer, uh -huh. you know, and stuff. And uh, emphasis on would be, sure, <laughs> and, uh, and also on frustrated. Uh -huh. <laughs> and uh, so, uh, yeah, I mean, I, I'd always been fascinated by the entertainment biz, but business, or uh, well, I didn't know the business as a mm -hmm. kid, but just the industry rather. Um, yeah. I, you know, I r loved the idea of 
you know, these crazy people on stage being able to reach enormous amounts of people, you yeah. know, and all that. Um, and uh, so once it became clear that I was not going to be a musician, you know, I was like, how can I, you know, become involved, you know, mm -hmm. in this? And uh, so the first uh, answer to that question was after I got out of school was to move out here to Los Angeles because at that time I was going to be working, you know, in the movie business, which mm. I did for the first four years that I lived here. Um, what did you do? I did everything from the crappiest little PA job up through, uh, that's production assistants, for uh -huh. those of you who don't know, um, and uh, up through second assisted directing, I did booming and sound. Uh, what, uh, and then I went above the line. I, I uh, was in development for a bit. My last regular industry job was I was a producer's assistant. Oh, wow. Yeah. Any and, movies we'd know? No, um, not that I worked on. Okay. No. I mean, I worked on a lot of little independent productions, you know, yeah. some mid-sized ones and stuff. And that was great because, you know, um, it was it was a wonderful opportunity to learn how the whole beast operated, and by, by the beast I mean the whole entertainment business, the larger entertainment business out here in Hollywood. You know. So it, was there one takeaway from that experience? Well, there was. I mean, it's it pretty much came at the end, which was, um, you know, I came to the realization that I needed to, you know, get out of that. I mean, I, <laughs> no, I mean, I, I loved working, you know, in that in that area yeah. and I wouldn't trade those four years for anything because like I said it made me learn how the whole thing worked sure. and all that which was fantastic but I finally got to the point where like I started asking myself okay are you comfortable being 45 or 50 years old and doing you know 29 hour days nine days a week mm -hmm. you know on set mm -hmm. you know somewhere out in the middle of nowhere in finland or whatever and, right. and my answer to that was uh no yeah. <laughs> I, that's not what i saw yeah. so the uh, first couple of years yeah i was getting acquainted and and uh with all the places in hollywood and i had a very different circle of friends back then it was very mm -hmm. uh, much uh a case of uh east coast transplants like mm -hmm. myself mm -hmm. and uh after that um, you know, I started branching out again because I was getting bored and um, and electronic music was finding its way into more clubs and stuff. And, you know, I liked, you know, parts of it and stuff. Yeah. And um, but what I was not impressed with was um, so many of the clubs uh, and, and this time period, by the way, this is like 1991 through 95. OK. okay. Um, most of the mainstream clubs in Hollywood in those days uh played very low quality, a very low quality of music. In sure. There. Uh, most of it, uh, when you were not talking about pop songs or whatever, uh, you were talking about third-rate commercial house, middle-of-the-road knockoffs mixed with 80s mashups. It's, mm -hmm. it's completely unimpressive. Mm -hmm. It's like and they would play, some DJs uh, would play, you know, the same song three or four times a night. Wow. And it's like, what the hell is this? Yeah. You know, yeah, I mean, yeah. well, I knew what it was. They were going for the mainstream people, sure. the people who were just in there to, you know, get fucked up and try to get laid, you mm -hmm. know, and all that. Um, and so I was becoming very sick of this after a while. Um, I mean, I was photographing in some of these clubs. I, spe I was, well, I was photographing in a few different scenes at the time. Uh, I was doing the gothic and industrial stuff, which oh, was, cool. that was, yeah, that was very yeah. cool. Depressing people, but fantastic fashion sense. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah. Great, I mean, great to photograph. Oh yeah. Sure. Great to photograph. Yeah. Um, where, and, where'd the idea come from to, to take pictures? Oh, I, I, the, the idea came about because I wanted access to these clubs yeah. and as a young suburban white male, I'm the last guy that the bouncer <laughs> is going to let in there, you right. know, uh, if I'm by myself, yeah. you know? Uh, I realized that very quickly. So I, I had some friends of mine who were promoters and stuff. Okay. And so they, you know, wanted publicity, of course. And I was like, bingo, this is my ticket in, yeah. you know? And uh, one of the scenes... And did you know, like, had you studied photography? Did you know? No, I, just, I went to school for video and film production, you know? Okay. And, and there are some parts of that that are very similar to photography. Sure. And, because, you know, the video and film or video and... Photography, rather, it was film in those days. Yeah, uh, I mean, they're very simple. They're both visual arts, uh, you know, and some things are the same. You know, lighting is lighting, composition is composition, you know, right. and all that. Yeah. Uh, so it wasn't a huge jump uh, from video, you know, to stills. Um, but uh, the, the main reason why I started that, besides getting access to the clubs, is that um, 
especially, and I guess it started in the Gothic, you know, kind of stuff. I mean, I wanted to really get, not just document the scene that mm -hmm. I was shooting in. I wanted to get that whole vibe across, you know, on the film. Because in the clubbing magazines of the day, um, and there were several yeah. in those days, um, most of the photography that appeared in those magazines was really substandard. Um, you had no idea really of what was really going on there. And the reason, the main reason was is because most of these were not shot by professional photographers. They were shot sure. by clubbers with little disposable cameras most of the yeah, time, yeah. you know, whatever, yeah. and which looked like crap, <laughs> to yeah. be honest. Um, so, and I knew that, you know, there's so much more going on. So the question for me became, how do I get all this on the film? And that's really where my photography career began. Is to how do I get that in, that vibe across to the viewer? So how do you? It was um, there were a number of things that I did. Um, this was really the like I said the beginning, the real beginning of my photographic uh, education, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and so I had to really go back to basics and figure out and see you know what is film and how does it work you know and all that and how can we get all this stuff on there and uh, the first thing I did was to start shooting with very high speed film mm. um, which is very very light sensitive which means that you can use that in a very dark place like a club right you know yeah um, and then I started doing other things like uh, doing very long exposures to and camera movement to create like swirls and swoops of energy, mm -hmm. you know, from the special effects lighting in there. Uh, I would uh, use stuff like uh, stroboscopics, which w I would just take the flash off the camera and just pop, start popping that flash like crazy mm -hmm. to create multiple images within one thing of film. Mm -hmm. I would do... Um, I would take colored gels and slap them on my flash head because I would use sometimes multiple flashes. Mm. And uh, it was basically to introduce more color and all and more vibrance and energy to that thing. To, again, to replicate what was going on, you know, inside the club that sure. you couldn't capture with a conventional picture. I mean, one of the things that I... Um, that I realized back then is that uh, what I was doing there was basically capturing the moment. Yeah. And a moment doesn't necessarily last one one twenty fifth of a second, which right. is pretty much the standard, you know, uh, speed that you shoot a picture mm -hmm. uh, with a camera, most of the time anyway. Um, sometimes a moment ma lasts much longer than that. Yeah. And most of the time, people when they try to capture a moment, they try to do it within multiple images, multiple mm -hmm. frames of film back mm -hmm. in those days. Uh, so you would get, you know, a, a, a series of six or seven pictures which would show, you know, that moment going on. I wanted to see, I didn't want to do it on six or seven images. I wanted to do it on one, Yeah. you know. And um, and that's that was the goal in the early days. And uh, fortunately, I was able to put all the pieces together, you know, and, and make it work. Right. And not long after that, that's when people like Herb and stuff started noticing my stuff and sure. said, "Do you want to start shooting for us?" So was there a first? Was there like a first break that kind of made things start happening for you? There was. Um, it was the uh, <laughs> and it came out of a very very bad uh, turn of events, and it was. Uh, the 1996-97 New Year's Eve party called In Seventh Heaven in mm. downtown. Which I don't remember. You don't remember this? No. Okay, this was the New Year's rave bust of all time. Really? Yes, and uh, it, it's a long story, but I'm going to give you the very short thing. This was run uh, by uh, CPU 101, uh, but run by Tefu, mm -hmm. and also with Go Ventures with uh, Reza, yep. Reza Garami. Wade uh, Hampton was involved with it mm -hmm. as well. It was held at what was then the Grand Olympic Auditorium. It's in downtown. It's gone now. It's now a Korean megachurch. Yeah. But um, it was uh, going to be an indoor-outdoor thing. It was supposed to have between like ten and 15,000 people there. And uh, what to make a very long story short, what happened was um, there was a vendor in this uh, – one of the vendors in the, uh, in the event. Uh, this was a guy who uh, – was trying to cash in on the then herbal ecstasy market. So I, I do remember. Yeah, and yeah. what he did was he he was supposed to uh, have this stuff, which uh, the main ingredient was uh, kava kava, mm -hmm. and he could not get the kava kava in the amounts that he needed. So instead, what he did is he substituted an industrial solvent, 
you know, for wow. this. And uh, he actually tested this stuff out beforehand and on four, four people, and I think all of them got sick from it. And he said, I don't care. I'm going forward. So he started distributing the stuff for free at the party, yeah. and people started dropping left and right. It was yeah. ridiculous. And uh, so the police came in, the fire came in, the fire people came in. Like more than 50 people ended up going to the hospital because of that. And they shut down the whole thing, and the people who were outside waiting to get in were not happy about this. Yeah, so yeah, there course. was a, there was a riot, you know, that ensued. Yeah. And um, Mixmag, or what? Not Mixmag, the uh, English one. Uh, Mixmag Mixer. US, yeah, which yeah. would become Mixer. Right. Uh, they found out that I was there, and they got hold of me, and they said, "Do you have any pictures?" And I said, "Yes." So they sent over. So I sent over a whole bunch of pictures, and they ended up giving me the cover mm. uh, with uh, and for, and that was my very first magazine. Um, submission and stuff so you're for your very cool. first mis- submission to get the cover i mean that's, that's huge awesome. yeah. yeah and so well it was awesome for me for sure yeah, yeah. yeah <laughs> not so awesome for the, you know, the event man I, I i took i was at we we had a herb table at um at the shrine mm-hmm. 94 okay so i forget if it was it might have been edc early mm-hmm I forget what party it was. Okay. But, uh, and anyway, the, you know, we had, it was me, Todd, and Raymond, like, working this table. Mm-hmm. And the guy from, the, I don't know if it was the same Herbal Ecstasy, but there were a few of them back then. No, not the same guy, no. but uh, And so, anyway, he came by, and he was an advertiser, and so he gave us, like, some samples. Mm-hmm. And I was like, all right, fine. And it was the worst. <laughs> it was garbage. It was such garbage. Yeah. Oh, it, I regretted it. Like, oh yeah. Instantly. Well, I mean, you just saw there was a. Story. I mean, I didn't get sick, but it was just a shitty. Oh, it was terrible. Yeah. And it, it, yeah, I mean, and uh, I mean, I just remember. Well, a few days ago, just a few days ago, um, I saw a story, and I don't know if this is you know true or not. I haven't seen any uh, verifications of this yet. Yeah. But uh, there was a story about um, the supplements that people buy at GNC, uh-huh. and that apparently seventy five percent of them are garbage and it's fake. mostly baking soda and stuff yeah. like that. So, yeah. yeah, I mean, I, I would love to see clarification to that, but it, it illustrates no, the same that. point. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. yeah there's, no, there's no regulation. No. You're relying on people who's, who just want to make money right. to uh, be right. honest about it. Right. And that the, doesn't usually work out. No, it doesn't. But, but ironically, at least in Southern California, I mean, I can't speak for the rest of the country, but at least in Southern California, if you're talking about Never mind herbal ecstasy. If you're talking about real, the real thing, yeah. I mean, this place was known for its high quality. Oh yeah, you know MDMA that for was sure. running around. I mean, these were not just just MDMA either. I mean, these were the days of Mitsubishi's, you uh-huh. know, and uh, and Batman's uh-huh. ones. But by the uh, Mitsubishi's, I mean whoever the guy was who put that concoction <laughs> together. I mean, that guy should get the Nobel Prize for Chemistry because that was amazing. Nice. <laughs> James, find out who that guy is. Let's get him on the show. <laughs> because he, man, I mean. So take us back. So at, yeah. this, uh, the Mixed Mag cover comes out. Yes. What does that do for you? Like it, what, what, it got me what starts in, happening? It, more magazines start noticing me. Yeah. Herb, Herb noticed me. Uh, Mixed Mag was the first. Yeah. Uh, Herb was soon after. And yeah. then uh, there was, um, <clears throat> excuse me, and um, uh well, they would change its name to Mixer, and then uh-huh. there was, uh, BPM Culture, sure. and then eventually uh, Insider. And yeah. I don't know if you remember Insider. Yeah, yeah, of course, Chang. And, yeah, Chang Weisberg. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And no, uh, I ended up being on staff uh, on Insider, and they would usually nice. give me about a quarter to a third of the whole book, you know, which was great. That yeah. was fantastic, I, and that meant I could really go nuts. Yeah, sure. You know, and, absolutely. And um, no, I love those guys, man. They were they were always the nicest guys at the party. They were. They were. It's. Um, Unless you started fucking with them, <laughs> that, <laughs> then you I don't look, know, I never look had out. That then you look out. But no, I mean these were never not just the magazine. Yeah. Um, I mean we were the guys who put together the Cypress Hill Smoke Out, uh-huh. which was, as I recall, the first real, I guess, proto festival that was half hip hop and half electronic. Yeah, you know, I mean no other hip hop uh, festival would touch you know electronic music Absolutely. at that time, but. Uh, you know, and but uh, we were lucky because you know we had Cypress Hill in our right. corner, um, yeah. which was a huge help. Um, and there were some great stories from the smoke out. I'm sure <laughs> there was one time. Oh god, the second smoke out that we did that was so funny. Yeah, pre-show, 
this was at the Orange Show in San Bernardino, and we thought we were going to get maybe fifteen to twenty thousand. We got forty three. Mm-hmm. But uh, anyway, before the gates are opened, uh, we're sitting there in one of the uh, quote unquote green rooms. It's the artist tents, yeah. and so, uh, it was us. It, it was Chang, me, some other guys, Cypress, and some other group. Some guys from other hip hop groups. I don't remember who at the moment, mm-hmm. but. Cyprus had just come off the road um, on their Smoking Grooves tour, which they would had done with, uh, let's see, Dilated Peoples and yep. Everlast and Public Enemy and yep. I think KRS-One. Um, but anyway, while they were on the road, they had come up with this con- concoction <laughs> known as the Cypress Hill Suicide Mix. Oh, shit. The Suicide Mix was a blending together of seven grades of extremely high-grade pot <laughs> mixed in a raspberry gel and smoked in a hookah. Oh, wow. Yeah. And so there's this hookah in the tent. Uh-huh. Now, I had not smoked from a hookah in a number of years. I had forgotten how good the plumbing was on those things. Crazy. So I take one of the tubes, you know, and I inhale, take a hit. <laughs> And I feel like I'm sucking air. Yeah. Like not, not even the little irritation at the back of the throat, you know? Yeah. So I feel like I'm so, something's wrong here. Hold on, hold on. Let me take another. <laughs> Still feels like I'm sucking air. What, what, what's going on here? So I tilt my head up, exhale, and this enormous cloud comes out of my lungs. And I'm like, oh, shit. <laughs> and then a couple of minutes later, I was like, oh, shit. <laughs> Uh, yeah, crazy. that it was, it was, it was really funny. Yeah. <laughs> and, um, but yeah, Cyprus was really, um, uh, supportive of the whole idea. You know, they, they were looking forward, even though their own, you know, uh, their own sales were beginning to dip, you know, sure. they, they, they were looking forward to new stuff and, um, yeah. and it was great. I mean, it was, it was the, the smoke out was a really great success and it was kind of a, a harbinger of things to come, you yeah. know, because other people, you know, would start, you know, um, mixing different genres of music and mm-hmm. stuff. I mean, the, of course, the most, the best example, modern is hard. Yeah. You, know, you know, they're doing basically following the smoke out formula, you know, although yeah. Gary Richards would never admit to it. <laughs> sure. Uh, no, I shouldn't, I shouldn't uh, tease Gary like that. No, he's a good guy. He can take it. Yeah. Yeah. He can take it. Yeah. Um, so uh, anyway, though, uh, the magazine stuff was what really opened things up to me. And yeah. when I started shooting for BPM, that's, of course, you know, Stephen John Levy noticed my stuff and said, hey, do you want to shoot album covers for Moonshine? Mm-hmm. Which I did. I mean, I shot album covers for Carl Cox and Ferry Corsten and nice. DJ, and, uh, DJ Dan and Donald Glaude and Charles Feelgood and yeah. Baby Ann and stuff. And uh, So I want to get to what you're up to now. But, yes. But I have a question because you're – you know, you kind of started uh, photographing at the same time that rave culture, dance music culture, was sort of really forming. Yes, right? well, Into a community it, and it was, it was, <coughs> it was, it wasn't really forming at that point, but it really blew up. Right. That's because the the rave scene, as you know, um, has not gone on a continuous success no, story I'm, up like a line graph. Absolutely not. No, it has come and gone in waves. <clears throat> and yeah. um, and which I talk about in my first book, uh, my photo book, uh, Dance Floor Thunderstorm. Yeah. Um, the uh, these waves have come and gone. The, the first wave, and, and there are no exact dates on this, but the the first wave was roughly 1988 through 94. Mm-hmm. This is when the seeds of the whole thing right. were being sown. This is really where the whole thing was being formed, and, yeah. know, as you mentioned sure. there. Um, and these were also the times at the end of this period, the first few early successes, you know, and stuff. And then for, depending on where you were in the country, for about a year and a half to two years, there was a big police and media crackdown, which forced everything way back underground, mm-hmm. it made things a lot harder for the promoters and for the artists, you know, and all that. And when I became involved in it, which was the beginning of 96, end of 95, beginning of 96, that's when the second wave was really beginning to get moving. And this second wave was about 96 through 02. That's Mm -hmm. what what I write in the book anyway. Mm -hmm. And this is when everything blew up for all of us. You know, this is what made, you know, all our future successes possible is that enormous explosion um, of talent and uh, and parties and you know and all the connected stuff so So my question is is what what role do you think 
photographers play in shaping a culture? They have they have a very important part in shaping a culture, and this is not unique to electronic music sure. either. I mean, my my photographic heroes were rock photographers like Neil Preston and mm. Jim Marshall and Ross Halfen and early Annie Leibovitz. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I mean, because these are the people who capture that moment, that, that incredible moment that the artist is trying to get across to the audience, you know? Yeah. And uh, it, it is not easy, you know, um, sure. because you have to know the artist, you have to know the show, you have to know the music, uh, you have to know what's coming up, you know, and all that, and how to get that th amazing thing. The way that photographers did that mostly back then was um, attaching themselves to bands. Right. You know, I mean, Neil Preston, again, Neil Preston, I mean, he became famous via his uh, Led Zeppelin and The Who and Queen, you know, yeah. work, you know, yeah. among others. Um, you could still do that today, but it's a lot harder. Um, but, yeah, I mean, we had Jeff Moore on the show who kind of was like the homie of Red Hot Chili Peppers and mm -hmm. he ended up touring with them and building their mm -hmm. their visual work, right? So yeah. I totally get that. Does that work the same with, with DJs? It's harder. It's a lot harder. Yeah. Um, it's, it, it's a bit easier now because there's more money yeah. in there with the whole EDM thing. Yeah. Um, in the 90s and early 2000s, it was practically impossible to attach yourself to a DJ and expect to make a real living going on the road with them because I'm the sure. money just was not there. Yeah. You know, the mainstream music business just did not support the, the rave scene whatsoever, yeah. you know, in those days. I mean, I remember, I mean, the main reason why I was able to stick it out so long is because I was, the main way I was uh, making my living was I was writing for a national comedy radio network. Oh, wow. I know we only had weekly writers meetings. Uh -huh. So the rest of the time was my own and I could do whatever rave stuff I wanted. Nice. Um, yeah, but I remember in those, uh, this was for American premier up in the Valley and, um, American premier is a very, very big, uh, radio mm. network mm -hmm. and, uh, was it, it was bigger then, but anyway, um, these guys, among other things, would produce syndicated uh, material for their various stations across the country and stuff. And it would consist, the syndicated stuff would be consisting almost entirely of pop, rock, right. country, yeah, a little hop, a little hip hop, and almost no electronic stuff. Once in a very long while, you would find a track in there from like the Chemical Brothers or Prodigy yeah. or Crystal Method or something like that. But that was it. That, and so when I was when I was at Herb, we had we made a deal with Pete Tong to bring uh, Essential Selection mm -hmm. over to the U.S. Mm -hmm. And uh, you know, and and I think we learned the hard way because as far as we knew, <clears throat> you know, so Pete had Essential Mix, which was the sort of more mainstream show, right? And then Essential Selection was the long form mm -hmm. mixes. So he'd have Carl Cox and right. Barry Corston, whoever, and do this two hour mix thing, right? But you know. For us, like in our world, that just seemed like a no brainer. Like it was it was huge, you know, big DJs, right, exclusive sets in the US. Right. <clears throat> and then we got out to radio and like they they, they never heard of Pete Tong, right. they didn't care. Right. They're like Scooby Doo. They're like, Err? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. They had <laughs> no interest. And so it was a weird you know, it was an interesting time when like our world like collided with the sort of outside. Oh, yeah. And and it was particularly frustrating uh, for a lot of us because we would be, you know, I mean, working in radio, you know, as, as I did back then, I would get the radio trades, like yeah. records and radio, yeah, radio yeah. and other things. And we would get the attendance figures from shows. And yeah. we're talking about people like, you know, like Mariah Carey and Rod right. Stewart and whatever. And they're pulling in... 10,000, depending on the venue, 10,000, sure. 15,000, 20,000. Impressive. I mean, and then Electric Daisy Carnival is bringing, and then EDC or Nocturnal Wonderland is bringing in 40,000, yeah. 50,000, you know, yeah. dwarfing those attendance records, bringing in much more entertainment value for your money. Sure. You know, I mean, instead of an hour and a half show, whatever, you've got an eight hour show right. with multiple DJs, multiple types of music, entertainment, everything. You know, yeah. I mean, the, the, the value for your money back then in the rave scene was so much higher 
than it was in the mainstream. It was absolutely yeah. I mean, it was sure. no surprise why dance music fans you know would gravitate towards the rave scene. You know yeah. that, and also the warm and embracing nature of the scene itself. You know, you, I mean, it's hard. You know, we shouldn't talk about this now, and you know, uh, for our, you know, it's a little hard to imagine for people that didn't live through that. Yeah, that like. Um, I mean, now, you know, David Guetta, uh, uh, you know, a lot of these guys are household names. Right. Right. And Calvin Harris. Calvin Harris, right? Yeah. Cascade, whatever. Right. right. And, you know, it's sort of hard to imagine a time <laughs> when, you know, when that was, as you say, it was like, you know, demonized or, the, or right? Or there was this like mm -hmm. this movement against that. Yeah. Um, what do you think? I don't know. I sort of have my own thoughts on this, but but in your mind, what was the what were the tipping points where that really became a mainstream thing? It, the tipping points there were. It wasn't really a case of tipping points. It was what a case of what I call again in, in Dance Floor Thunderstorm the benign subversion of the mainstream. And the way that this happened was the music started popping up in movies, yeah. TV, soundtracks, gaming. You know all of that. So that, you know, people are being exposed to this almost subliminally right. because it's just a part of their everyday existence. They don't really pay attention to it, but it's there and it influences them on a level that they might not immediately understand. I don't mean a level making parents run out to go raving, you know, and right. all that. but, sure. you know, but become more accepting of it because like, oh, that track. Yeah, I heard that on Monday Night Football. I mean, when the Crystal Method got their stuff on Monday Night Football, I was like, okay, that's <laughs> that's yeah. probably, that was probably a tipping point. <laughs> it's funny because I remember, you know, people would come to us at Herb and want to make, you know, want to pitch a show with us at MTV. Mm -hmm. And they, and they had this, yeah, I, this happened like three times, right, where yeah. someone brought me, you know, a treatment for a show and they, they were, they were defending the idea of the show with how mainstream dance music had become right. using the example that it was in all these commercials. Right. And I remember saying to him, like, you don't get it. Like, that's some creative directors who want a certain sound for their spot. Mm -hmm. Or they get, you know, we, you'd see those guys at Giant on the weekends, right? Mm -hmm. Kind of exploring. Oh, yeah, Magic Wednesdays. They would come into Magic Wednesdays all the time Absolutely. to soak up the atmosphere. Exactly. But, you know... But the consumer, the viewer, and in mass was not there. No, they weren't. Right, there and yet. I was like, "You're." And I didn't realize at the time that like we're just ten years too early to be <laughs> yeah. having this conversation. Yeah, right. Yeah, I wrote a sitcom pilot, you know, back then based on Louis the Fourteenth. Mm -hmm. You remember Louis yeah, the Fourteenth yeah, restaurant? For those of you who don't know, Louis the Fourteenth was a amazing little restaurant slash club in Hollywood. Uh, that served gourmet, organic French Polynesian food, which uh -huh. was, and uh, they had the most amazing music in there that you can imagine. It, it was the for five years. It was the first home for the Bud Brothers Monday Social, which mm. was a, a fantastically right. successful club that ran for twenty years over several venues. But those first five years at Louis, those were magic. Yeah. I mean, it's. I wish I could have been there for all, you know, all of those nights because, sure. you know, you, you get people in there like, you know, the propeller heads, you know, where everybody would be standing on the chairs, you know. Like, right. Uh, I mean, that place was the first time I met um, John Digweed. That's where I first met. I think that's where I first met the Crystal Method there. That's where I first met David Holmes. Yeah. Uh, you know, lots of people there. It was a great. It was the place was basically Cheers plus house music. Uh -huh. And that was the formula that I wrote for the script. And the script was okay, but That's like hilarious. you said, we were ten years too early. Yeah, 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 for sure, <laughs> for sure. Um, so, okay, then you created your own publishing company. Yes, I cr I created my own publishing company uh, to put. Why, up why do it yourself? It was basically again out of necessity uh, because I had been I put together the. A pitch package for my first book, Dance Floor Thunderstorm, the big yeah. ass coffee table photo book that eventually came out. Um, and I pitched this thing to about 25 different uh, publishing houses, ones that specialized uh, uh, or fancied themselves specializing in either photography or music or pop culture or sure. all of the above. Yeah. And I got 
turned down unanimously, you know, by all of them. And it's difficult enough to pitch a thing to a book publishing company when you're, you know, not known in the book industry. Yeah. It's another, it becomes even harder when it's a subject matter that they are completely unfamiliar with. Of course. You know? Yeah. And uh, so, like, half of those publishers, the just the notion just went whoosh, right over their heads. They yeah. just did not get it. The ones who did get it, about half of them didn't want to touch it. Uh-huh. It was like rave, ugh, you know. Right. <laughs> and uh, the rest, uh, it was, um, these guys were, most of them were sympathetic. Uh, I remember one of the last rejection letters I got from one of these guys, and it was really well written. I mean, it was almost <laughs> apologetic in tone. I hope from and a it, book publisher. This. Well, yeah, and, and, and it was basically, we love your photography, we love your concept, we love, this is edgy, this is hot, but we don't know how to market this. Yeah. And my jaw just hit the floor when I when they said that. Yeah. And I mean, it's like, I'm like, I didn't say this to them, but in my head, I'm going, "You're a book publisher, and you don't know how to market books." Sure. <laughs> yeah. So, so that's when I realized, yeah, I'm gonna have to do this on my own. And yeah. I knew nothing about book publishing back then. I mean, I didn't want to do it, mm-hmm. you know. But there was no other way that this thing was gonna come to fruition. Yeah. There, it wasn't going to happen otherwise. Yeah. So over the course of four years, I put this thing together. I brought in more herb alumni, you know, to, I mean, I brought in Josh Glazer to oh, edit cool. it. And I brought nice. in, um, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, one of the graphic designers uh, to come in and do it. And cool. uh, yeah, and it took about four years to put the whole thing together. It was off and on, you know, if we've been on all the time, we probably could have gotten it done in two and a half, maybe three years. Yeah. But we put the whole thing together. I put the publishing company together and, um, you know, we started so you, pitching. You say out of necessity, but, you know, 20, 25 rejections, mm-hmm. um, you could have given up along the way and just I decided not to make a book and right. do something else. Right. What, what kept you going? It was just, it, it really, when I first part, when I first started putting the thing together, it was done partly because nobody else was doing it. Yeah. You know, none of my old colleagues, photographers or writers or otherwise, were putting any sort of histories, official or personal or otherwise, about the rave scene out there. Mm-hmm. I mean, it, it just wasn't happening, mm-hmm. you know? And I was getting tired <laughs> of explaining to everybody I ran into just what the rave scene was. Yeah. You know, it was, I mean, like, you know, it was much easier in some aspects to be able to hand them a book and say, have a look at this. Right. This is what happened, you yeah. know? Um, and uh, so the first year was spent basically going through my archives, figuring, I mean, we're talking like over 100,000 film images. Wow. Yeah, I mean, I have bookcases completely filled with pages and pages of slides Crazy. and you know and all that. Yeah. So it and uh so it was going through all those and trying to figure out what form this thing was going to take, what I wanted to say with words, did I want to bring in outside talent in, mm-hmm. which I did. Mm-hmm. I brought in uh DJs. I brought in Christopher Lawrence and Sandra Collins and Mark Lewis in for interviews for the cool. book. Um and Josh and I would, you know, be going over this constantly, long distance, because Josh at the time was right, based right. in Berlin. That's right. So we, I would have to get up at, you know, before six o'clock in the morning to get on Skype with yeah. him and my graphic designer and going through. It was, it was a nightmare. Crazy. It was, a, but, uh, but thank God for Skype, because otherwise we wouldn't have been able to do it at all. Sure. And uh, we, uh, yeah, I would have, would have had to get another editor here in the states. Um, and uh, this. It was just, it just took so long. It just took, and uh, finally, though, we put the whole thing together. And when I got the first books in from China, that's where we got them printed Mm -hmm. because that was the only way it could be affordable. Um, When I first got those things in, it was like someone asked me, um, you know, is this like, uh, you know, having a first look at your baby? And I said, (laughs) well, yeah, it is, except it's different because a human being. Uh, you know, gestates for nine months. This took 40. <laughs> <laughs> so, Crazy. yeah. And, uh, it, but uh, it was the first of its kind. Yeah. It still is the first of its kind. There are no other big photo uh, books out there about, you know, the glory days of the rave scene. Yeah. Um, and it really put me 
on the map outside of the rave scene. It's more mainstream media started paying attention to me. And stuff. Nice. And uh, yeah. And I uh, got a lot of great attention. I mean, um, yeah, Vice did stuff on it. BuzzFeed did stuff on it. Mixmag, uh, you know, so many. I mean, Paper did stuff. Um, mm -hmm. Slate mm -hmm. and stuff. So stuff that I mean, organizations that hardly paid attention to the scene at all you right. know, before. And so that was yeah. very gratifying. Yeah, you know? I bet. And, uh, and it basically gave me the, um, even after four years, I found I still had enough energy and stuff. And I said, okay, what else can we do? What? And that ended up being the next book, The Raver Stories Project. Cool. Yeah, so so I want to hear about The Raver Stories Project. Mm -hmm. What did you learn, as, as you said, you, you didn't know book publishing. Right. What did you learn in the first book that changed how you approached the second book? Well, the first book was different because in a sense it, it, and at the risk of sounding rather selfish it really was it wasn't just about the rave scene it was about me yeah you know and so it was my point of view my interpretation yeah. and um and i didn't want that to be the case for the second book i mean okay. i wanted to contribute to it but i didn't want this book to be about me that I, I i originally thought well maybe i could write my rave archives you know yeah. and that you know my story whatever and then i thought well you know what that First of all, who gives a shit about, you know, the stories of a photographer running around at underground parties? Mm -hmm. And two, um, one person's experiences in the rave scene is not really indicative of the larger scene as a whole. Sure. So I needed outside viewpoints. Yeah. And um, and uh, and I thought, you know what, maybe the, the text way is the way to go, you know, for this one. Um, mm -hmm. Because printing up a photo book is expensive. Right. It, it is. I mean, I had to... Um, yeah, sure. I mean, I had to put together an Indiegogo campaign to partially finance the printing, you know, of the last book. Yeah. Um, a text-driven paperback book is much cheaper, you know, to do. Um, and uh, so at that point, I was like, let's get these outside viewpoints, you know. And uh, so I put out a call for submissions. This is based, This is October of last year, of, mm -hmm. of uh, 2016. And... Um, I put out the call for submissions to the electronic music community asking for, you know, their uh, most amazing or memorable, you know, stories about what, you know, their most memorable experiences in the rave scene, what, whether it was good or bad or whatever. I mean, I, I didn't really care very much. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, <coughs> excuse me. Um, so um, I thought initially this was just going to be an American book. You know, and uh, and when I started getting submissions from England and from other countries, I was like, okay, this is this is different. This is ex yeah. uh, expanding now. It's not just a question of uh, these sto uh, little stories about crazy parties. Mm -hmm. It's also a larger, overarching story of the growth and evolution of the scene itself, because we have stuff in here from both generations of rave um, fans. Right. We have the original yeah. rave generations and we have the EDM generation, mm -hmm. you know, and, um, and you can see the change in perspective as these stories, you know, go along, you know. How would you, if you had to generalize about that change? Um, well, I mean, it's, you look in the stories and you discover that, well, first of all, getting back to the whole rave, initial rave do-it-yourself DIY, you know, thing. Yeah. Um, in the initial, uh, in the, the first few stories, I mean, you've got uh, people talking about, you know, going to map points mm -hmm. and, and uh, mm -hmm. going here. For those of you who don't I know what that. a map, oh yeah, for, for those of you who don't know what a map point was, um, back in the uh, early days, of this and this is before uh, internet and before the mass marketing on, of parties on the web, um, the way that you would find out where a party was is that you would go to a, uh, like a, underground record store or clothing store or whatever, and you would find rave flyers mm -hmm. you know, in there with lots of phone numbers on them that you would call for information and all that. And the day of the event, they would change the message on those things to give you directions to the map point, and you would drive to this place, and you would try to be as inconspicuous as possible, yeah. and you would find the guy there um, who was uh, had the directions to where the party really was, uh, or sometimes they would have a directions to another map point, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. and 
it, it was basically like a big scavenger hunt, you know, yeah. sort of thing. And when you actually got to the party, you felt like a real sense of accomplishment. Mm-hmm. You know, you found the place, you got there. Yeah. And there are these other people there who were just as passionate about the music as you were because they made that effort to go out there and find there. You don't find a lot of that stuff in the EDM, in the EDM stuff, because it's, like I said, it's basically served up to the uh, party goers on a platter, an electronic platter. Yeah, and some of that is just the change in our society, right? Where, yes. Where we have the ability to access anything at any time. Yes, that's true. And it's, it, you know, it's hard. Like, I remember, like you do, the old days when you had to work harder, whether it was to get records or to get anything, mm-hmm. food, right? Like, and, you know, there's something to that. There was some value. I remember, you know, getting to my first rave after having gone to the map point and all that. And, mm-hmm. yeah, you felt the sense of accomplishment. Flip side is, you know, it's it's kind of hard to argue to do that when you don't have to. Right. That's that is absolutely right. True. Like, why would you put yourself through all those paces? Right. If, if it's not necessary, I don't know. But that you know, society as a whole has kind of moved on. Yeah. No. You no. You're right. It has. I mean, the technology has enabled us to you know send a message anywhere at any time, whatever. Sure. Which means that you know you don't have to go to the map point. You can just get it on your phone. Yeah, so so is. how does technology, you know, think about photography? Mm-hmm. So you're in a business photography and now book publishing. Right. Uh, both of which have been upended yes. by technology. Mm-hmm. Right. And, you know, I find it interesting to be a professional photographer in the era of Instagram. Yeah. When every person on earth has a has a great camera <laughs> in their pocket. Yeah. Um, how, it comes to what do you do? What do you do? You find your own vision. You yeah. you you put for it's the same thing you did before except it's magnified now yeah. uh you have to have your own visual style you have to have your own vision you have to have your own idea of why your stuff is going to work for this client yeah you know i mean you have to set yourself apart yeah because technology especially now with uh, i mean photoshop lightroom and all the plugins and everything i mean the, the computer can do 95 percent of the work for you now yeah. you know and uh it's and a lot you see a lot of material out there from what i guess you might call lesser talented photographers you know and stuff and some of these clients you know they don't know the difference sure. <laughs> you know but um what and book publishing is yeah i mean book publishing has been interesting now because um the reason why the Raver Stories project became possible was because of a new technology called print on demand, mm-hmm. which is basically, uh, let, me, let me give you a very brief background into printing books. Um, the traditional way of printing books up until about 10 years ago is called offset printing, which is, you know, you, um, you print up a huge amount of books you know, mm-hmm. and put them in a warehouse somewhere, and then you distribute them to your bookstores and whatever, and they sell them, whatever. And it, it becomes a long chain or whatever. And this was the way that, you know, uh, most, well, the whole industry pretty much operated. And it was a very difficult industry to get into if you're an outsider. Yeah. Print on demand is different because print on demand is, um, it's not offset printing. It's essentially, if you want to simplify it, it's a, um, I guess you could call it kind of high tech photocopying. Mm-hmm. And which means it's much cheaper to put together small batches. You know, when you do offset printing, you have to you know fork over a lot of money yeah. to make all those books, or whatever. But with print on demand, you can print one book at a time, which right. is beautiful. Which means you have no storage issues, you have no insurance issues, no shipping right. issues. You know, it's fantastic. Yeah. So, and it was only uh, now print on demand only really came of age a few years ago. Uh, before then, it was the quality was just not up there with regular offset printing. Sure. But you're going through the book right now as we're talking, and I mean, what do you you see the quality there? Oh, I mean, it looks what, great. Yeah, absolutely. Right, and this was only possible. And I see some of, some friends' say. names in here, which is always, <laughs> that's always fun. Sid Z, yeah, Wade, that's cool. Glazer, mm-hmm. nice. Yeah, and uh, so are you? Um, what? What do you want to happen with this? And are you trying to build a publishing company? Is that the goal? I would. I would like to put out, you know, uh, more material, you know, under my publishing company. It's fifty one fifty publishing. Nice. <laughs> I think you can figure out what that name means. <laughs> <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, I mean, I do want to put out, you know, more stuff. But I mean, ideally, I would love to, 
have 5150 be brought into the fold of a larger publishing company. Because okay. when you're running a publishing company on your own, I mean, you're wearing a lot of hats. Yeah. That's a lot of work. Absolutely. And uh, and it's frustrating at times because, you know, when you've got no one else, you know, on board, you know, to help you out, uh, I mean, it just, things take longer yeah. and all that. And it, it, it becomes frustrating. And so, um, I mean, it's been a blast putting these two out or whatever, but I certainly wouldn't mind, you know, having a larger company pay the bills, you know, and and make the effort to get the books out to larger uh, area larger um, groups of people yeah you know I mean the the main reason why I put the raver stories project together was because of the very very negative slant that the mainstream media has always applied mm -hmm. to the rave scene and to yeah. electronic music like we discussed earlier yeah. um, it was I mean even now I mean like this year's EDC for example I mean it was one person, you know, died, you know, right. which is, of course, you know, terrible and all that. But that was the thing that all the mainstream media immediately focused on. Sure. They did. They almost nobody reported on what was actually going on inside the gig itself. Yeah. The artists, the fans who were having fun, the enormous amount of money that Insomniac was making and bringing to the Las Vegas, you know, community yep. and all that. I mean, Pasquale has had to trumpet his own horn, you know, absolutely. With all that that. absolutely. So, so, so given that mainstream antipathy yeah. towards the, you know, towards the scene, I mean, that was the main reason why I put Dance Floor Thunderstorm out. And it's also the mainstream main reason rather why I put, you know, the Raver Stories Project out to counteract that voice. And to give, That's great. and to, just to establish maybe a little bit of fairness, you know. Well, I know you work with with uh, with brands, with clients. Mm -hmm. What's one thing that you want them to know about uh, about dance culture? Well, it would be nice of them to know that it's not toxic. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, I mean, uh, that's pretty much the attitude that a lot of them have taken for the last twenty years. I mean, yeah. that's been slowly over the last few years beginning to reverse itself you know and again it's through mainly uh commercial enterprises right you know again advertising you know and sure chunks and all that um i mean it's it, it's is there, is there a right way is there a brand you think of that does the best job of kind of embracing the culture Ooh, that's a good question um hmm i'll have to think about this if we're talking about outside of clothing companies that deal speci that cater specifically to the rave audience. Uh -huh. um, hmm. That is a really good question. I um, mean, it's because there aren't a lot of, I mean, you see stuff showing up in like TV shows mm -hmm. you know, here and that, that, but there, I don't know if there's really been a single brand or company that has been able to focus exclusively on this and make it work mm -hmm. you know um i mean this there are certainly companies that dip into it right. you know and try to make it work you know for their product that they're pitching you know sure. or whatever but yeah. but i don't think there has been one that really has gotten 100 percent on board okay yeah and mm -hmm. it's unfortunate but it's it is a reality yeah Mm -hmm. Cool. I got to get to a lightning round okay. where I ask you a bunch of questions okay. and you answer them. Lightning round. Sounds interesting. <laughs> Tell me one decision that changed your life forever. One decision that changed my life forever? Moving out here. When I, uh, I, mean, I spent a year getting out of school. At the time, I wanted to get into sports broadcasting. Yeah. I wanted to be a sports producer. And so, nice. And, uh, well, it was, and it was fun working in that area, but... Uh, I spent, after getting out of school, I spent about almost a year trying to get work across the country, you know, in some market or another in sports, and it wasn't working. Yeah. And uh, it basically got to the point where I had to ask myself, okay, is this what you really, really want to do? Mm -hmm. And the answer was no. <laughs> and, uh, yeah, and so the question, the next <coughs> question was, how do, what is it you want to do? And I said, yeah. I don't know, but it involves show business in some form or another. And that meant two places, either New York mm -hmm. or L.A. Yeah. And so it ended up being L.A. Cool. Mm -hmm. Complete this sentence. Mm -hmm. I don't have talent. I have blank. I don't have talent. I have blank. Um, I don't have talent. I have drive and vision. 
Nice. So if I worked for you or if, I, if we were, you know, collaborating on a book or something, mm -hmm. what's something I would hear you say over and over? Uh, rewrite, rewrite, rewrite. <laughs> <laughs> Polish it Good. up. You know, it's, yeah, uh, yeah it, it really comes down to it. There's When you're writing something out, and this is true for photo layouts too, by the way. Yeah. Um, when you're putting when you're putting something together like that, I mean, you really have to be very precise in how these things fit together, whether mm -hmm. it's words or pictures or both. Mm -hmm. You know, yeah. yeah, yeah. Who would you be most excited to learn as a fan of your work? <laughs> Who would? <have laughs> uh, probably Jimmy Page. That would be great. Nice. Of course, he has no reason whatsoever to uh, dip into the world of electronic music. So you know, he's probably got kids. Oh, he's well, got many, several his kids. kids. His kid, he's probably got grandkids it, who would be yeah. into, into dance music. Could be. Wouldn't mind if uh, his uh, old bandmate, Robert Plant, you know, he would probably have a little more uh, impetus to go poking around in like sure. music. He, he definitely, that's one thing I really admire about Robert Plant is that the fact that, you know, he refused to be a, uh, a prisoner of mm -hmm. his Led Zeppelin reputation. Absolutely. You know? Yeah. What's your favorite city to travel to? Mm. Good question. Probably Copenhagen. Oh, uh, yeah. Uh, Copenhagen's great. I, nice. I've been there a few times. and I just went to summer for the first time. Oh, wow. Awesome. Oh, great. Loved it. Yeah. Did yeah. you get down to uh, Niehaven? No. Uh, Nie the, the, oh, oh the, yeah, yeah. The dockyards. The, the, yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's yeah. mostly where I, I, I've i stayed. Oh, cool. There. And the, the funny thing is... is that yeah, I think that's where we stayed, actually. Yeah, my, my father, he's Swedish, and mm. um, when he was... Serving in the uh, in the Swedish army, you know, in the fifties, which was mandatory, you know, back then, um, he re remembers coming into Nihaven in those days. And back then, this place was it was really really nasty. I mean, it was where really? the sailors went. It was yeah, filled yeah, yeah. with tattoo parlors. I mean, sure. not not trendy tattoo right, parlors. Right, I mean, right. the nasty shit. But that stuff becomes trendy. It eventually became trendy. Yeah. yeah. And now Nihaven is, is is actually gorgeous. Yeah. It's it's, it's a I mean, all those beautiful multicolored uh, buildings yeah, you know, yeah. as you walk around the dockyards. I mean, yeah. it's, it's it's beautiful. They're it's building beautiful. some, like, floating hotel. Are they? I saw it, yeah. Now no, I forget the name of it, but they were there so much construction happening right there on the, on the water. Oh, wow. Yeah. Okay. It's cool. I didn't know that. And they also have their, the, um, they have a Tivoli Gardens, mm -hmm. you know, there, which is pretty much the first real theme park. Yeah. Probably. They came around. People ask about Six Flags. Well, this, this place was one flag. Uh -huh. <laughs> Absolutely. And, uh, and it's still there. Yeah. And it's, and it's great. Yeah. I mean, it's... Um, no, it's cool. They have, a, you know, it's not an enormous theme park like Six Flags or anything. Yeah. But it is cool. They have some small roller coasters and yeah, some yeah. other things in there. It's awesome. It's a nice place. What, uh, is, is there a book that's had the biggest impact on you? One book? Oh, or one yeah. that comes to mind. Uh, there's a few. Um... One of them was uh, getting back to the Led Zeppelin thing. It was uh, was Hammer of the Gods, mm. which was the the first book. It came out in '85, and it was the first real biography, and it was a bit more than a bit sensationalist biography about Led Zeppelin and stuff. And cool. it made an impact on me because a I was a fan, and b I happened to be in London at the time when the thing came out. I oh knew, wow! I knew nothing about it. Yeah. Um, but I snatched you know snatched up a copy then flew home and I would show my friends and they were like, what the hell is this? We can't find this in bookstores anywhere. Yeah. Exactly. It's coming. But, sure. And, and it, would, it arrived in the States about a year later. Oh, right? that's awesome. Yeah. Um, if there are any, I mean, there's certainly a number of books. But God, why am I blanking on this? No, now? that's a good one. <laughs> yeah. what, what movie do you think you've seen the most in your life? Jaws. Nice. <laughs> Easy. Jaws was still one of my very favorite movies. Uh, I still think it's probably Spielberg's best movie that he's uh -huh. done. Um, and uh, part of the reason was is because, uh, as I mentioned before, I grew up in Massachusetts. Mm. And, and Jaws was shot on Martha's Vineyard in right. 1973. That was, you know, that's the Martha's Vineyard of my childhood. Yeah. So when I watch Jaws, not only is it a great movie, but it's a very nostalgic thing because I can look back and can watch it and see, okay, that's how it used to be. You yeah. Know? Yeah. I mean, Martha's Vineyard now I mean, has become quite a bit more uh, shishi than it used to be. I mean, there's there was always a rich element there. I mean, the, the Kennedys you know, mm -hmm. always had properties mm -hmm. there for years and stuff. 
but uh, decades rather. But um, yeah, there's a lot fewer people from the poor side of the tracks on that island now. <laughs> yeah, I'm sure. Yeah, I'm sure. Yeah. Who's your favorite DJ? It's my favorite DJ. Mm. I would have to say it would probably be a toss-up between okay. uh, Carl Cox and Christopher Lawrence. Oh, wow. Yeah. Um, Carl, because he brings still so much enormous energy to yeah. his performance. I mean, it's like you know, if you need a DJ that's going to get the, the, the room moving in five minutes or less, Carl Cox is your number one choice. Number two is probably Donald Glaude. Oh yeah, yeah, and uh, and Christopher, because Chris, he and I have been really good friends for a very long time, and when he and Sandra Collins and Taylor and Thomas Michael and uh, the Moon Tribe guys and John Kelly, when they launched the whole progressive trance thing <coughs> in the late '90s, I mean the, the West yeah. Coast progressive trance, I mean that was such an amazing sound yeah. that they put together. It was perfect. For the desert, mm -hmm. uh, it was perfect for arenas, big places. Not so much for little house clubs. Mm -hmm. you know? mm -hmm. um, and when Christopher would just go put on, you know, his like trance arias, almost. I mean, it was just you just swoop sweep the whole room up. You know, I mean, that's of course the idea that you know for any DJ, but for that music at that time. Oh yeah, sure. Yeah, it, yeah. it was fantastic. The whole progressive trance thing was really, really a lot of fun to nice. be right in the middle of. Yeah. yeah, and it was also great because at the time, like I said, you know, in the do-it-yourself days, you know, when the progressive trance thing started, like about '96, '97, whatever it was, um, yeah, it was small, much mm -hmm. like the scene itself, you know, mm -hmm. and it, and both would just grow and grow and grow, and it's, uh, yeah, I mean, Christopher and I talk about this in Dance for Thunderstorm. I mean, it was. Although I will say this, I do miss some of the old days, the really old days where Christopher or his um, colleagues would have their DJ tables on the floor, mm -hmm. on a card table, mm -hmm. you know, or on or stacked on uh, things of uh, on cinder blocks, sure. you know, uh, not yeah. 70 feet up in the air right, at, right, at right. a festival. I mean, th that's one thing that I really, uh, about festivals today that... I really don't like is the isolation of the DJ from the audience. Yeah. You know, because I, I, I loved the fact that, I mean, Christopher and I would be at the Alexandria hotel <laughs> in downtown. Mm -hmm. and we have 500 people in a room. The tables were on the floor. So Christopher and I were literally standing next to each other, shoulder to shoulder while he's playing. And there's 50 people. I'm um, just, clustered around us watching Christopher do his thing and the other 450 people in the room can't see anything right so it's it's for them it's all about the music yeah. it's not about the talent it's not about yeah. the brand you know it's about you know what is this person doing to me mm -hmm. you know with his with his music absolutely mm -hmm. so how does everybody find uh, the Ravers project the Ravers stories project yeah it's getting really good response both from the uh, electronic music community and from uh, mainstream um, where right. do you get it? Hmm? Where you, do you get it? You get it on Amazon. Okay. Yeah. You can, um, there are a few uh, stores that will carry it, uh, like uh, local ones here in Southern California, mm -hmm. like Romans in Pasadena, uh, Diesel in uh, Brentwood, and a couple of other places. But it's primarily online. Cool. Okay, it goes for fourteen ninety nine. Awesome. And uh, it's got, like I said before, it's got stories going all the way back to the original rave beginnings in England uh, in the late eighties and the Acid House explosion. Um, up through basically EDC 2016. You nice. Know, it's um, and pretty much everything in between. I mean, there's, yeah. there's mansion parties in there. There's desert raves. Burning Man is in there. Ministry of Sound is in there. Um, it's uh, it's it's a really wide um, range of experiences, and I think that's one of the things that have uh, enabled more people uh, to identify with it. It's not just a total little niche sure. kind of thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's and, awesome. Um, yeah, I mean it's uh, <clears throat> when I've you know I've got a story coming out later on uh, in the Sun in England you know about the last book which oh, is yeah. coming out, which is interesting they took two years late to uh -huh. it up but hey better late than never absolutely um, it's uh, yeah and uh, I'm sorry I'm blanking on that that's all right how do how do we find you online 
You can find me online with Google. <laughs> That's okay. pretty much the easiest way. Yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, I've got my own website, michaeltolberg.com, but that needs to that needs to be overhauled. Oh yeah. It's, it's I had the last time I really touched it was about three years ago. It really. Oh yeah, yeah. yeah. Lots changed. I'm yeah, sure. a lot has changed. Um, but uh, yeah, you could find as far as uh, my books go, you can go to raverstoriesproject.com or cool. dancefloorthunderstorm.com. Uh, you can find my present photographic materials on uh, gettyimages.com because that's who I shoot for now. I do a nice. lot of uh, red carpet stuff for them, uh, concerts and some clubs and um, celebrity benefits and that sort of oh, thing. Oh, cool. So, yeah, awesome. so you'll find um, – yeah, Harvey Weinstein uh, made me quite a bit of money this last month. <laughs> I bet. I bet. Well, I'm glad somebody's uh, benefiting from that. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks for doing this, man. It's been oh, a my pleasure. pleasure. Thanks for coming. I'm excited to read the book, and uh, and definitely we'll follow what comes next. All right. Awesome. Awesome. Yeah, that was Michael Tolberg on Rebel Radio. I hope you enjoyed it. I know I did. Uh, leave us comments or something on Twitter, Facebook, YouTube, whatever. You can find us at Rebel Radio Net. Uh, make sure you come back next week. I'm going to launch a very special edition. We're going to do, I think, four episodes in a row that I recorded on the streets of Beijing, China. Uh, our Rebel Radio China edition is coming up next week. Make sure you check that out. Peace.